Today, we are going to be taking you on one hell of a journey. We're going to take you on a journey to how money really works. And what we're going to show you is the back office. We are going to show you what happens behind the scenes for each and every single one of our money multiplier clients, our clients that are participating in the infinite banking concept. Because, hey, listen, we all know that this machine this specially designed and engineered whole life that we set up to drive these privatized banking policies and the infinite banking concept, which is the process we use, we all should know, and probably most of you do, that this machine is nothing more than a place where your money goes first. It involves changing one thing, folks. And if you watched that video earlier, we take the money that we save, the money we keep, which is law number one, you should be keeping one-tenth of all the money you make. And what do we do? Well, some of you take the money you earn and the money you keep save, and you put it in somebody else's bank. You put it in somebody else's account where they then go out and make money, having your money work for them. What we're going to just simply do is change where that money goes first, and we're going to put it into our own bank. Now, our own bank is nothing more than a specially designed and engineered whole life policy that is built for one thing and one thing only, and that is banking. Do not call us or come to us if you want one of these things built for death benefit. You will not like us and we probably will not be friends. But we've changed where that money goes. Now that we've got the money in the machine, which is a specially designed and engineered whole life, where it is comfortably earning a guaranteed interest rate plus dividends, but now it can comfortably be moved back out of that machine into investments or places where you want that money to work for you. And you are in full control and while this is happening, your money never even left your account. It is earning uninterrupted compound interest the entire time, but yet we get to do some fun things with that. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. <music> what happens after your machine is set up? What does the team that we have invested heavily in, the team that Brent Kessler and Terry and Hannah have created with us helping and this team is there solely to function as your back office. You don't have to pay for this. All you have to be is a client. You have to just start a policy with us and you get access to our mapping team. And this mapping team is designed to do one thing and one thing only, help you make your money go to work for you. Or in some cases, help you get all the money back for all the cars you're ever gonna buy driving on. Or in some cases, help you pay off all your debt while recycling and recapturing all of the money that you used to give away to Visa, Amex, Discover, Amazon, who else, uh, KeyBank. Yeah, you get the drift. <laughs> Everybody that you're writing checks to every month, we're gonna take that money back. The mapping team solely will organize that, show you and map it out. Now I want you to envision something, right? I just came from California, so I'm gonna give you a real example. I have no idea how to get places in California. So all the rental cars, I had a, a Nissan Sentra or whatever the hell the thing is, they have a GPS. You put the address in and the GPS says, turn right, turn left, 0 0.008, you have to get off at 13B and, and that's where you go, right? We've all used GPS. You understand GPS is quite well. But what happens if I'm you know, in my car and I'm driving this rental and I'm trying to get to the airport and it says, get off at 13B, which is 0 0.006 up, which means I got to get over to the right. What happens if I'm just like, ah, I'm not going to listen. I'm just going to go straight. Am I going to get to my destination? Well, the GPS is going to course correct and say, get off at the next exit. And what if I ignore that one? I just keep ignoring it. Am I going to get to my destination? No, I'm going to get lost. I'm going to get frustrated. And I'm going to feel like I failed to get where I was supposed to be, which is the airport. And then eventually I miss the plane and then I don't, don't get to see my family. So I want you to envision that. Our mapping team is your GPS. You have to put the coordinates in. You have to tell us or the mapping team where you want to go. And once you tell them where you want to go and you give them some specifics about how you think you're going to get there, well, I'm gonna rent a, a Nissan Sentra that has a GPS and I'm gonna put the address in and I wanna to go to the airport, right? So you have to give them the directions and the specifics that you're gonna get there in. And then they will map that out and provide you several tools that will aid you in doing that. So again, I think one problem that we have, Stephen, you deal with this a lot, and Andrew's dealt with this a lot, is people will get the machine, they will be all ready, and then they will be ready to go to the mapping team, but they will then say, well, okay, what do I do with my money? And we're like, well, what problem are we going to solve today? Well, I don't know. I thought that's what you were going to tell us. 
Does your GPS know the destination you're going to until you enter it? It does not. It is not going to guess for you. It is not going to put the address into some miracle place that you just were like, oh, wow, that's a cool place. Let's go there. No, you have to put the destination in first, which is what our mapping team needs from you. What problem are we going to solve for you? And then what we're going to talk about solely in today's training is we're going to show you how this back office works, how it solves problems for real clients, because that's the only examples that Andrew has is real client examples. We will not be using any names. We will not be using any, you know, pertinent information or, you know, protected information. We're very good with that. We're simply just going to show you the process, but I want to be clear. What I'm going to show you is exclusive to just the money multiplier clients. If you come to us from, you know, if you if you go to one of our competitors and you say, hey, can I hire you guys to do your mapping stuff? No. The way you get to the mapping is by being a client of us and it costs you zero. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're really going to go deep into this and we're going to show you some really cool things that Andrew's prepared for today's training. Before we get into these cool things, Stephen, is, do you think everybody, or actually let's ask, does everybody have an understanding of what I'm talking about when I say the money multiplier or what I'm talking about when I say the specially designed and engineered whole life? Because we always, yeah, so St Stacy said, nope, she has no idea. A bunch of people are saying yes. Let me just see how many other people have no idea what I'm talking about. Because we'll go back because now we have almost 160 people on and most people do. Kind of, okay, kind of is good. Nope, got another note, Velma doesn't. So we do have some new newcomers on there. So oh, no. Yeah. That's all right. So what we're going to do is we're just going to take a second and I'm going to have Andrew share his screen of the, the example that I did from stage. I want to show you what this machine looks like now. So Todd said, uh, no idea what it is. So after this training today, because we're not going to spend the whole training teaching you what the infinite banking concept is or teaching you what this privatized banking policy is, we're going to send you a video, two videos for that matter, one which is 20 minutes long, which is me explaining it from stage this weekend, and another one which is 90 minutes long, broken up into 10 parts that you're going to be able to watch after. Because I don't want to you know, waste a lot of time for the people that have already seen this and that know about this and really want to learn like, what is this mapping? How does that work? How do I solve my problems? But let's just take a second, Andrew, if you could share the screen. So here's what I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you what it is that we do at the Money Multiplier. And it's quite simple. We change one thing, folks. Can all of you right now in the chat, just tell me that you have the capability to change one thing in your life. Can you do that? Yes. Or, or you can put no if you want. If you, if you put no, then I don't think we're going to be able to help you. So you guys can all change just one thing. Now, the only thing that you're going to change to make this work for you is you're going to change where the money you keep goes. Now, some of you are confused by that word keep. You're like, keep, money I keep, money I keep. The money you save. The money that right now you make that isn't pledged to go somewhere else. In other words, how much money is left over in your bank account every single month? that money. How much money is going to your investment account each and every month in the hopes of making your returns? Yes, that money. How much excess money is going into your 401k, 403b, 457, TSP, whatever the hell else they call those? How much money is going in there above and beyond the amount that they give you in a match? Yes, that money. We are only going to talk about where the money you keep or save goes first. We're going to change one thing. And we're going to change the direction of where that money goes. We're going to put it into an account. And that account is going to be a machine where you're, it's going to store your capital. But really, we're not going to store anything there in a perfect world. We're going to put it there. And then from there, we're going to find a place for that money to go to work for you. Because all of you have probably spent a good part of your life, if not your entire life, working for money, trading your hours for dollars. And over the course of your life and your working career, you have started at one level of the amount that your hour is worth, and then you have evolved and gone up. Some of you maybe even evolved to the point where you're making a certain amount per hour, and then you get a bonus based on production. We've all been through that. You so you're trading hours for dollars. The wealthy do something very different. They have spent most of their life, yes, trading hours for dollars, working, hustling, all the things that you want to call it. But what they've also then done is learn either through educating themselves, never from college or regular schooling, but from educating themselves, seeking the knowledge or learning from other people who have done what they want to do. And they have learned that it's not about how much money you make trading hours for dollars. It's about what the money you've made, the money you keep, 
does to go to work for you. Your money has to work for you. And if it doesn't, it is simply dying or it is working for somebody else in most cases. The banks, when you go to the bank and you deposit that hard earned money into the bank, does the bank put that money in a box with your name on it in the vault? No, it does not. The bank moves your money and makes your money, your hard earned money, go to work for them. How does it do that? Well, it lends it out. How many of you have taken loans from the banks? Say I. It's every one of you. Every one of you, I, have taken <laughs> loans from the banks. Those loans are the bank making someone's money, my money, James's money, Andrew's money, Stephen's money, work for them. And they make a spread. They pay us. How much do they pay us on our money? I, I, I seemingly forgot, but let's just pretend <laughs> it's 1% because it's not. It, but let's just pretend. I, I know, James, <laughs> it's not 1%, guys. I get it. I know it's not 1%. But just keeping things simple here, 1%. The bank pays you 1%. And then the bank turns around and makes a car loan to Stephen for four. Mm -hmm. How much is the spread that the bank made? Simple math. Stephen's paying them 4%. The bank is paying you one. They make a three point spread. Mm -hmm. Cool, right? How many of you want to make a spread on everybody else's money? Great. Well, unfortunately, you're not a bank yet. So therefore, nobody's going to give you their money to deposit it in your bank. But you do deposit your money that you traded hours for in somebody else's bank. That is where the story starts. And that is where the other story, your old life, the old way you treated your money ends. We have to now make our money work for us. Law number two of wealth. Law number two of wealth is quite simple. It is simply you making your money work for you. And that is where this starts. But the place where we put this capital is not someone else's bank, is not Wall Street, is not for the 150,000 time this week in IUL. It is a specially designed and engineered whole life. Now, before we get there, for the, those of you that probably have misconceptions and I'm watching the numbers, but we haven't lost any yet. So just before you go to the bathroom, which means our attendance drops by one, listen to me. I am not talking about a normal, regular whole life that you buy from your broke ass brother-in-law. I am not talking about the normal whole life that you went to the insurance store and bought. And I am not talking about the whole life that Mr. Guru Dave Ramsey or Susie Orman talks about when they say whole life is the worst place you can put your money. How many of you, <laughs> what if I'm already in the bathroom? <laughs> Drew, I don't even want to know anymore. Just stop. I like it, but don't need to know I like it, well. but I don't need to know anymore. <laughs> All right. So we are designing the contract on a whole life. Dave Ramsey, Susie Orman, and all the people that have told you that putting money in a whole life is the worst thing you can do, I'm going to agree with them. I am going to tell you that they are right. If you take your money and you change one thing and you put it into a regular whole life that your broke-ass brother-in-law sold you so he can make a big old commission, you are going to be upset because you're not going to have access to any money immediately. You're not going to have access to any money in the first year. You're probably not going to have any access to money in the second year. And you're probably not going to have any access to much money in year three. Does that sound like a good place to put your money? Yes or no? Put it in the chat. I hope all of you say no. That would be a terrible, terrible place for you to put your money. But now, do you have this up? Now let's say you put your money in a specially designed and engineered whole life. And now all of a sudden you have access to your money immediately in the first 30 days. And it could be sooner. It just depends on when your check clears. And immediately in that first 30 days, you have access to, depending on how the plan is designed, to anywhere at the lowest side of 60%, but at the high side like this one of over 90%. These numbers you're looking at on the screen right here. This is a real client of ours. His name's Kevin. I can't give you his last name. He was 38 years old. Okay, we just did this plan for him. So this is even the new plan design under the new IRS rules. But this is, believe it or not, a specially designed and engineered whole life. Holy smokes, look at those numbers. Here's Kevin's scenario, and this might be many of yours. So here is a whole life that is designed and engineered to work for what we're going to talk about for the rest of the training, which is the infinite banking concept. I want to be clear about something. Too many people think the infinite banking concept is a product. It is not. You can't buy the infinite banking concept. You, can, you can't do anything other than follow a process. The infinite banking concept is the process of taking back the banking functions in your life. And then to use the infinite banking concept, you have to design the machine to facilitate it. This that you're looking at, folks, believe it or not, is 
that machine, a specially designed and engineered whole life. Now here's Kevin, 38 years old. He had 50 grand sitting in a bank account, somebody else's bank. Andrew's getting happy with the uh, controls here. Sorry about that. Calm yourself down. Too much coffee. So he had 50,000 sitting in somebody else's bank. And he heard a presentation, much like the one we were playing earlier. And he's like, man, I don't want the other banks to be making my money go to work for them. I want my money to work for me. So we said, okay, Kevin, we got to change one thing, bud. We got to change where that money goes first. So he said, great. Where do we put it? And I said, we're going to put it into this stupid, specially designed and engineered whole life. Yep, that's right. He said, really, Chris, you're, you're going to put my money in a whole life. That's the magic thing. I said, nope. What we're going to do with it after we put it there, that's the magic. And that's what we're going to talk about. But he did. He put 50 grand in. And then he said, well, all right, well, what if I want to continue to keep saving? Right now, I save money in the bank. And he was saving about 600 extra dollars a month. So, you know, we came up with $491.25 every single month that Kevin is going to save in this new account, this new machine which we're going to, from here on out, call this Kevin's Bank. Kevin's Bank is a specially designed and engineered whole life. So we know the numbers. He dumps in 50 grand, moves it from his bank account, okay, at Bank of America or wherever, and shifts it over to his bank, which is the specially designed whole life. Then every month, he put $491.25 into it a month. Now, immediately in the first year, Kevin had access to only 51,554. Because I know some of you are looking at and you guys can do math pretty good. You're like, wait, I'm waiting. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, folks. Technical difficulties, which shouldn't happen when you have the technical guy I sitting know, next right? to you. He's getting, he's getting excited, folks. He gets very <laughs> excited about this stuff. So he's just, and the only thing he knows to do when he gets excited is push buttons. Just click, I just click. So, all right. So he only has access to $51,554. As you can see up top, it says cash available. So if you're doing the math, you're like, wait a second, but Kevin put 50,000 plus he put 5895 in the first year. So he put 55,895 and he can only use 51,554. Chris, that sucks. Can't even use all of his money. Like, how is this thing so good? Well, let's continue on, shall we? Because although that's all he can use in the first year, which is about 90% of his deposit, some people would say that's terrible. This is never going to work for me. And if that's the case, well, I don't know why we keep gaining attendees, but if that's the case, then this is not for you because getting wealthy, okay? And notice I didn't say rich. We're all rich right now. Everybody feels rich. Rich is the next poor. Read Robert Kiyosaki's book, Second Change. You'll understand that. Rich is the next poor. Wealth is when people learn how to not just become wealthy or become rich, but then they learn how to keep their money. So wealth is a marathon. Building wealth is. Okay, so it's going to take time because compound interest, what Albert Einstein calls the eighth wonder of the world, is compound interest. And he says it's the most powerful thing in the universe. Those that understand it earn it, those that don't pay it. Kevin understands how to earn it. So therefore, he's not playing the short game, he's playing the long game. But Kevin's long game really only takes a couple of years to, to become really sexy and really cool. So let's look at this. How long have we been doing this for? Stacy? Uh, I've been doing this over 20 years, but you know, for the rest of the team, it varies. So he put 55,895 in. In his first year, he had 51,554, which we're going to show you what he did with that because he definitely doesn't leave that money sit there. He wants to take that money out. Now, why would Kevin want to take that 51,554 out in the first year? Well, let me pose the question to all of you. So listen up because I want you to comment on this. If you had money in your bank account, Okay, you had 50,000, we'll just use 50,000. You had 50,000 in your bank account. And I don't know, somebody you know brings you an opportunity that's going to make you 10%. Okay, and the 10% is secured, it's ultra safe. So you can make 10% on 50,000 bucks. But the only 50 grand you have is in this stupid, specially designed and engineered whole life. Okay, so let's talk about your regular bank. If you had 50 grand in your regular bank, you would take that money out of the bank in a heartbeat to go make 10%, right? And then how much money would you have made if you, if you had 51 grand in your bank account and you took 50 out and the bank was paying you 1%, how much would the bank continue to pay you 1% on if you started with 51,554 and you took 50 out? Simple, right? 51,554 minus 50 gives you 1,554. Richard, good shot. It's pretty close to zero. But you'd have $1,554 in the bank account earning 1% because you took the other 50 out to go make 10. So now that's a regular bank account. Now let's just pretend that you found a better bank. 
i.e. this specially designed whole life. And you put 50, and you had 51,554 and you take 50 out. Now, how much is the insurance company paying you interest and dividends on? The answer is $55,895, the full amount of the deposit, or just if we're going to compare apples to apples, 51,554 to compare it to the bank. All of it. Because when you took the 50 grand out, you didn't take your own money. The insurance company lent you money. And then some of you are like, oh, there it is. There's the, yep, I'm going to the bathroom now because now they're going to lend me the money, which means they're going to charge me interest. Yes, they are. So let me ask you if any of you would have a problem if you had a bank that paid you 6%, like Kevin's bank, that paid you 6% interest on your money. And then when you took that money out, that same bank charged you 5%. So now you were able to take almost all of your money out. The bank was paying you six and it cost you five to take it out. What's your spread? 1%. Does anyone on here have a actual real bank account paying them more than 1% or even 1% for that matter? No. So you wouldn't be too upset if the bank paid you 1% net spread on money that you now had in your hands to go make 10%, right? Welcome to uninterrupted compound interest. The ability for your money to actually work for you, making interest and dividends while you still have the ability to then take it and go make more money on it. And unless any of you have a way to do that with some vehicle that I'm not aware of, this might just be something you should listen to because this, when I heard about it many, many years ago, was like me just, I, I don't know. I had a coming to Jesus moment. I really did. I was like, this is real. This is real. And then I went, yeah, it seems too good to be true, doesn't it? Well, it's not, but let's go to year two for Kevin's policy. So now we understand how it works, okay? And Chris, two. yes. Real fast. So this is just an example. The amount that you fund your policy with can be completely different is whatever you want. There's a lot of people saying they don't have $50,000, so they're not going to be able to do this. So don't worry about that part. This will work for almost any financial situation. This is just one, one example. Yeah, I mean, folks, don't get hung up on the numbers. This is Kevin's plan. This isn't, this isn't uh, Stacy's plan. This isn't Jim's plan. This isn't Liz's plan. This is Kevin's plan. These were his numbers, his money. Whatever your numbers are, your numbers. Maybe your numbers, I got $5 million that I want to put in. This doesn't apply to me. <laughs> Well, good for you. You've been keeping some money for some time. <laughs> awesome. Let's design yours around 5 million. And then someone else on here is like, man, I got like $5,000. Great. Let's start with your numbers. Don't get hung up in the numbers. I'm just giving you an example and a good one because this is relatively a small plan. Somebody said in the chat earlier, it's that you, you wouldn't be surviving if you didn't have money somewhere. You have cash flow coming. You're going to find the money somewhere. $500 a month. It sounds like a lot. really isn't. You know, it's not that much. It's something, and putting that aside for something for the future where I can get, you'll see the power of the system. Once you see the power of the system, I'm sure that people will be able to find a little bit more uh, to be able to put into it. So, yeah. I just saw somebody write in all capital letters, I don't have this kind of money. And then they logged out. Like, get the fuck out of here. Like, sorry, but <laughs> get out. Hey, you know I what I got to say to that, Stephen? <laughs> Good. Good lunch is served for you, buddy. Like, you don't. All right. Hell, yeah, anyway. Uh, uh, so, right. Listen, this isn't for everybody. Yeah. But the ones that this is for, it will completely transform and change your financial picture. For that guy that wanted to make sure that he put it all in caps, good. Go do what you're doing. It's obviously working well for you because you don't even have the money to, to relate to this. So sign up. Anyway, back to it. There you go. I love it. Brad just put, I started my first policy with $200 a month. My first policy was started in 2003 for $230 a month. So Brad, high nice. five to you, buddy. High five. All right, so back to this one for Kevin's numbers. In the second year, he was putting two or 491.25 in every month. So over at the end of the second year, he had $5,895 that he put in. Go to the next column, non-guaranteed cash value increase. So what that means, non-guaranteed means that it is his interest, which is guaranteed, and his dividend, which is not guaranteed. That's why we call it non-guaranteed. But these, this insurance company that we're looking at has paid dividends, I think now 146, 145 or 146 consecutive years, never missing one. And the dividend paid this year is the lowest dividend that they paid in, from what I know in the last 30 years, probably even longer, but I know of 30 years. So what does that number say? Stephen, what is year number two non-guaranteed cash value increase say? $7,141, $7,141. All right, folks. So listen, I want you to envision this. 
Year two, you go to your bank and you put $5,895 in at the end of the year by putting, you know, you did four ninety one a month. You've saved $5,895. And you go into the bank just to figure out, well, how much money do I have this year? Because the, the money you put in the first year, the $55,895, you took $51,554 out and you, and you put it into an investment making 10% or a loan making 10%. So the money from day, year one is already out working for you. Are we clear with that? So it's not the total amount. Every year you put money into this, you're going to take money out and make it go to work. So he puts 58.95 in and he has 7,141 that he can take out. So if you went into your regular bank that gives you dumb, dumb suckers and you put 58.95 in for the year and then the banker told you when you asked how much money you had that you had 71.41, you'd probably sit there and say, ooh, you made a mistake. Oops. Did somebody deposit more money in my account throughout the year? Because there might be a mistake here. I'm just checking for somebody else. I would sit around and say nothing. But. Yeah. <laughs> Most people would probably be like, oh, hmm. what, what, what mistake? 7141 uh, in there. All right, I'll take that money out. Yep. And you'd you run mad. out the door as fast as you could. You'd skip the coffee. You'd say, keep the dumb, dumb sucker. And you'd be like thinking, holy shit, they made a mistake. And I got an extra $1,246 in there. Or maybe if it was an insurance company that paid you dividends and interest consecutively and uninterrupted, that would just be the power of compound interest. Holy smokes. Yes, that's how math works, folks. You put $58.95 in, you got $71.41. That means you made $1,246 in your second year, or Kevin did for this matter, which if we did the math, that is a 21.14% cash on cash return. So how do you figure cash on cash returns? Different than how you have all probably calculated returns because you've done cumulative. Well, I put X amount in from the beginning and I have this much that I put in and I have that much in my account, you divide it. That's a cumulative return, which does not work in an account where our intention is to put money in, take that money back out and use it to make money a second time. So the only return that matters is the, the return you make on new monies that go in that year. Everybody clear on that. This is how we do it in real estate. So this is a cash on cash return, 21%. Now, let me ask you all a question. If I was willing to pay you 21% on your money and I just said, hey, listen, you just got to give me 5% off the top. Would any of you have a problem with that? Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller. Would anyone have a problem if I paid you 21% and you had to give me five? No, you'd be like, uh, nope. We're cool. Do I get a sucker? <laughs> no. Okay. You wouldn't be upset. There you go. Hell no is probably the correct answer. <laughs> well, guess what? This is Kevin's stupid, specially designed and engineered whole life. And these are, are his exact numbers off of his illustration. He put in 5,800 and he had access to 71. Let's fast forward. Let's, every year, just so you know, and every day for that matter, Kevin will have more money than he did the day before or the year before. Just math. That, not some special secret thing. It's not some market performance. It's not, well, if the index goes up by 10%, then the insurance company lets me to participate in that 10%, 100%. So I would make 10%. But if the stock market in the index goes down and I lose 11, I don't lose any, I get zero. Well, in this case, you don't ever have to worry about market performance because you're not going to make any market performance here. You're simply going to make a fixed guaranteed return and a dividend and that's it. So every year you have more money. That's simple. I know it's not sexy folks. Okay. But Sexy isn't what we're after. We're after safety. We're after security. We're after liquidity. And why not, you know, put it in an account that's tax-free because that doesn't suck, an account that's protected against judgments and liens because, well, that doesn't suck, especially if you're OJ Simpson and on and on and on. <laughs> Just making a point. Just saying. But if you go down these numbers, year five, he puts in the same amount. The four ninety one a month has fifty eight ninety five. He put in and can take out seventy four hundred. That's a 26% return. Year 10 puts in 58, can take out 50 or, or can take out uh, 9,000. And that's a 54% return. Just remember every time when you see the cash on cash return, what you're going to do is you're going to subtract the cost of capital. The same way that a traditional bank has to subtract the cost of their capital that you put in their bank. That's what we're talking about. The difference between their bank and your bank is you are in control. That's it. This account that Kevin set up puts him 100% in control of his money, 100% in control of the decisions he makes, where his money goes, 100% in control is what Kevin is. So now from this point, this is where we now need to see how this money can go to work for you and what it actually looks like. 
And that's what the whole mapping part is about. So from here, actually go to the, the slide where it actually shows how we move the money. All right, perfect. So here's how it would work, folks. I just wanna show you one of, this is my policy, just so now I can actually speak as it's, as it's my policy. Um, <laughs> that is so awesome. I'm just reading Jared's comment. What a freaking awesome comment. So the flow of money, this is how it would work, right? Whether it's my policy or Kevin's okay. or your policy, the first thing you do is change where the money that you keep goes first, i.e. the TMM policy, the money multiplier. Then after that, we'd find a place for that money to go to work for us. Mm -hmm. In this example, my money can go to work by paying off a debtor. My debtor in this actual case was Key Bank. I don't know if you have Key Bank in your state, but we have Key Banks all over the place. It's a big bank. And Key Bank gave me many, many years ago a line of credit an unsecured line of credit, and they charged me 9% on that line of credit. So what I did is I said, all right, every month I'm giving KeyBank $289 a month. But I now have this policy, this whole life policy that I have, 23000 which was the balance that I owed KeyBank at the time. I had $23,000 in my policy. Now, it took me some time. Actually, it didn't. I, I had, it took me less than 23 days because I put thirty grand in and took out twenty three. But whether or not it, I had the money sitting around or I had to save, the money. When I had 23 grand that I could take, I take it out and I take it as a loan. And there's two different ways you can get your money. You can borrow directly from the insurance company. In the case when you borrow directly from the insurance company, if I take 23,000 out, I'm not actually taking my money. What the insurance company is doing is lending me part of my death benefit. That's it. They're advancing me my death benefit while I'm living. That 23,000 represents 23 grand of the future death benefit they will pay out. So because of that, my money didn't actually leave my account. And then they charge me interest on that future advance of my death benefit. But the cool part about this loan, and I want to say this lightly because this is, I want to show that we don't practice not paying our bank back. Because if you owned a bank, each and every single one of you would pay your bank back the same way you pay somebody else's bank. So just remember, that's the general rule. Treat your money the same as you treat the bank's money, which means you, if you pay the bank back with interest in principal, pay your bank back with interest in principal. But if I take 23 grand, which is an advance of my death benefit, does the insurance company require me or ask me to ever pay that loan back? The answer is no. They could care less if we ever pay these loans back, because someday when we die, which the insurance company knows we're all going to die. And if any of you don't think you're going to die, I think we have to do another lesson about life. We're all dying. That's all there is to it. Okay, We started with that. So when we die or graduate and go on to a better place, the insurance company would just take this $23,000 loan and they would just subtract it from my death benefit and say, we're good. The insurance company didn't care that I lived 111 years, if I make it that long. They didn't care. It was just on the books. So the loan is in advance of the death benefit that does not need to be paid back. But here's what I did with the loan. I paid off that $23,000 line of credit. And when I paid that $23,000 line of credit off, I no longer owed KeyBank $289. But I want you to just really hang on these words, folks. Okay, hang on these words carefully. Treat your money the same as you would treat the other bank's money. There was not one month that I did not pay KeyBank $289 because I had to. It was an obligation. So now I paid KeyBank off with a loan from my bank. So therefore, because I paid it off with my bank loan, I'm going to pay my bank back the same amount that I paid their bank, $289 a month. All I did, folks, is instead of every month writing KeyBank on the check, I wrote Chris Noggle. Man, it felt good. And every single month, I do these with bill pays. Andrew and James know this. They, they know I get a kick out of it. Matter of fact, there's a rule around these parts that when they go and get the mail from the mail slot, the checks, and Andrew could recite this, the checks that they get, which are bill pay checks, are to go top on the pile on my desk. Why? Because I like tearing those little corners off. How many of you get bill pay checks, first off, and like them? Do any of you get bill pay checks that show up from whatever bank, any bank in the country? You guys like that? Say yes or no. Stacy doesn't like getting checks. Stacy, no, no, no. I don't think you heard that. Wow. I'm asking, do you like getting checks in the mail? I'll take Stacy's. Yes. All right. <laughs> All right. Oh, she doesn't get any. But, oh, but oh, Stacy, okay, you would okay. like to get checks every mail every month in the mail, right? Well, what if every check that you write to every debtor that you have was just a check that you then wrote to yourself? That that'd be a lot better, right? That's all I'm trying to say. So getting to it. $289 a month. I change the name on the check and that 289 goes back into my policy as a payment toward my loan. So when I pay my bank back 
I then, the very next day when the check clears, that $289 check, I have $289 to go use the next day. When I gave KeyBank $289, did I have $289 available? Nope. I had whatever the bank allowed me to use. I was not in control. So I just want to show that that's an example. But some of you on here are like, well, Chris, I don't have any debt. So what would I do then? All right, let's do that. One more. Same example, okay? But that 23,000, we don't have any debt. So now what do I do is I find someone like James here who needs a loan. And I'd find him on Private Money Club, which you guys can look it up. It's privatemoneyclub.com. It's like eHarmony for money. People with money that want to make money and people that need money come together. Check it out. So I find James on Private Money Club. And James has got an opportunity in the form of a real estate deal. And he needs 23 grand to finish the rehab. And he's willing to pay 12%. So I take a loan from my policy and I lend it to James through the Private Money Club. James then in turn returns every single month a check for 12% interest on my 23 grand. Well, that, 20, that, that interest that I get, that check that James writes me, I have a decision now that I'm holding the check. Where does that money go? Well, most of you have been taught to do what with that money? Well, let, let me go put it in someone else's bank and I'll grab a dumb, dumb sucker on the way out. I'm just changing now where that money goes. It's 12%. The 12% was made because my money in my bank is working for me. So I take that 12% interest and I just change where it goes. I put it back in my policy. Folks, draw a circle. Your money's on the left side. The opportunity's on the right side. You take the money around the top part of the circle, it lands in the opportunity. The opportunity, because your money is now working for you, creates interest, dividends, or gains. The interest, dividends, or gains has to go somewhere. Don't put it in someone else's bank. Don't put it in Wall Street. Change where it goes. Put it back into your bank, which is the bottom part of the circle. We are simply connecting a circle so that all the money in your family and in your life ends up in whose bank? Your bank. It doesn't matter what the opportunity. It doesn't matter if it's Bitcoin or crypto or it doesn't matter if it's a real estate deal, a syndication, a note. It doesn't matter if it's investing in the index, which I wouldn't suggest doing now, but it doesn't matter if that's what it is. It doesn't matter if your opportunity is just paying off your debt and recapturing the money. Do you understand? The opportunity is whatever you tell us. The opportunity is the destination you put in the GPS for the mapping team. All right, you can unshare that. Too. Does anyone have any questions on that or was that an okay definition of exactly what this system does and how it works? Anyone got any questions on that or do can we move on now to, okay, great. You were good. I've been I've been hitting a bunch of answers in the Q and A and stuff, so I think we're good. Winning. That's what Austin calls it. Austin's like that shit sounds like winning. Yeah, absolutely. You're right, Austin. That's what we do here. We win the money game. All right. So now, Andrew, I'm going to let him take over now. So this is the second component. Now that you've got the machine, you change where the money goes. You understand the concept of infinite banking concept, which is just that circle. Now this is what the mapping team will do for you. Absolutely. Maybe. This up here. We're just going to pull up. We're going to go over several examples of what one are we doing first. I haven't, I haven't decided which one I want to do yet. Um, let's take a look and see. Well, the first thing with mapping. So I, what's, I pulled this quote uh, a while ago. I just love it by Napoleon Hill that said, telling people to save money without showing them how to do it is like drawing a picture of a horse and saying, this is a horse. <laughs> A whole lot I could do with it, right? So it's really like having that. all this information and having all of this this data that we've just given to you, but trying to figure out how to use it is going to be a problem. And so with the, you know, it's like you know, you, does your bank tell you what to do when you get the bank statement and everything's coming in? And out? No, they don't tell you what to do. What we've created is uh, something called the money mapping team. The money mapping team is there to show you how to do it. Think about like training wheels once you've gotten this new bank. Because I mean, bankers, when you become a banker the first time, you open your first bank, you do your thing, you probably have a little bit of an idea what you're doing but you just kind of have to figure it out. Might as well use the experience. You, you've got a, some sort of guidance on, I'm going to invest here. I'm going to do this. I'm going to go, you know, make all of these different investments. You have a plan in place. And so that's what we do. And we start when we open up your bank as we give you the plan for it. So what I'm going to do here is let's do, oh, this one's a great one. So these are actual, these are clients that we have. Um, there's a couple that we're using names on. They are actually, um, we have done um, case studies on them. You can find some of these case studies on YouTube. But I want to show you a little bit about how this works. Let me share my screen here. We just lost four people waiting. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just kidding. Just yes. joking. They went to the bathroom. Shut the Patience bathroom. is not something everybody holds. Actually, we added some people because I think they're getting excited to actually see now what this is because we just spent the time going backwards explaining like how this thing works. Now we're actually going to put it onto numbers and show you 
exactly what they do. Now, Andrew loves getting into the numbers. So, oh, folks, yeah. sorry there's a this wall of like numbers, it. but this is, <laughs> well, and we probably should have, you know, got rid of the name, but no, no, this there's is a case study. study. That's right. So, he's already given us permission yeah. to use his numbers. Yeah. And so, that's what I said earlier is that this person does case study. You can find his case study on YouTube, on our YouTube channel, uh, where Chris and I go through a conversation and basically have the same chat that we're going to have right now. Jason came to us and he had this huge issue. So, um, he, he was, he had a hell of a lot of debts. <laughs> That's a lot of debts. He was actually paying more in his debts that he made. He had a rental property, thank God, that he could use to then make up the rest of his cash flow. But he had $155,000 in debt. Um, he, he had uh, 14 debts, including his car loan. He had a lot. And so what he wanted us to do is he needed a hand with this because you can see here, his interest rate, he was averaging 15.5%. His highest credit card was 21.99%. These are just, it's terrible debt. And what had ended up happening, he, he had um, started a business and it didn't go well. And so now he's stuck with a whole bunch of credit card bills. Going to be honest, a lot of people do this. This is not unusual, but $3,700 in debts per month. If he were to try to pay these off at minimum balances, it would take him forever, decades to pay off all of this debt. So what we did is we realized he's got, he, he had some money, he had some saved aside. And instead of continuing to pay off his debt with that money, he put it into one of our policies. First year, he put in 13000 or 30000 and then 15000 each year thereafter. So let's take a look and see what he's got here. So what we did is we took, this is a bit of an older version of the map, but it'll still show you what we're doing. 30000 he had 25000 that he was able to take out first year, okay, first year. So what we did is we went through, we paid off a Discover as well, Fargo, Home Shopping Network, Bank of America. We paid up all of these credit cards. Just paid them all off from that money. Took that money, put it back into a segregated account. He now has $532 going from, his, from instead of going out to other banks, it goes back into his bank now. So he's now reclaimed that in his bank. And at the end of 12 months, he has 60, almost $6,400 he was giving away to banks that now he can use to, in year two, Put 15000 into his bank. 13000 is what he got out of it. We paid off even more debts. Okay, so he used the 13000 plus a 6000 that extra 6000 that was going to other banks that's going to his, added that together, paid off the rest of his Citibank, Bank of America, and Chase card. And he just kept doing this. Now these three payments go back in. Now he's making 1,253. We kept doing this over and over again. And that's really all this, this tool is, is just shows you how to do it. We paid off all of his debt in four years. Four years. Would have taken him 10, 15 years to pay it off. Four years, we paid everything back. And now the $50,000 a year, yeah, the $50,000 a year that he was paying to other banks is going to him. So now he can use that for other things like investment. I mean, that's not well, even he bought the cash a truck. Value. Remember, he was yeah, he bought super a truck pumped to buy it. a truck. Yeah. yeah. So he actually paid it. He actually has a new car loan on top of all of this. We still had it paid off in four years. And the thing with him, though, that's $50,000 a year he was giving away to other banks. That doesn't include the cash value he's getting. That's just payments. And oh, yeah, by the way, he also gets a cash value on it, too. And it wasn't very far along on this. Let me see. It was, I think... Um, yeah, with him, um, it was in year seven, he started to get one more dollar out for every dollar in. This is an older policy, by the way. So mm -hmm. some of the policies we're doing now are quite a bit better. This policy is a couple And the years rating old. wasn't super favorable. Yeah, yeah. There were some other issues. They'll involved. see Everyone's better ones different. as we go through. Yeah, there's some factors that negatively impacted his returns, but it didn't matter about his return. So many people focus on the policy and, well, how much mm -hmm. is my policy's return? What am I making? You know, because they're so used to like the IUL thing that all the yeah. brokers want to sell. And no disrespect, you know, we're, we're always continuing to learn more and more about IULs and in doing that. And we're actually opening up to debates and doing calls with people that say that they know what we don't know about IULs. We're not being like, oh, I, IUL sucked it. You know, we're like, okay, well, if you can prove us different than everyone we've ever seen, we are more than willing to listen because everybody's like, oh, well, the return, the return, the return. Well, his return wasn't great in this, but the function of him taking back the money that he was giving away you just saw it in the map. I mean, that speaks for itself. Four years, debt free. Yeah. I literally could never have looked at Jason's scenario from day one and even, even believed that that was possible until we did the mapping. But once Jason got into the mapping process, can you put his map up again? Once Jason got into the mapping process yeah. and he actually physically saw the impact of what this would do, he, he probably first thought this sounds too good to be true, but he'd done his research and he was like, 
that's incredible that this can actually happen. To the tune of Jason in his second year started his second policy because now Jason didn't have all the debts. Even by year two, he had extra money and he wanted to put more of that money into his own bank instead of somebody else's bank because there's something that, that switched in his mind. And none of you can understand or comprehend that unless you've already begun your journey down this road. Because if you read the comments that have been coming in, I mean, from Meredith and everybody else, like they have that same switch happen in their mind. They maybe didn't believe it in the beginning. They said, that sounds too good to be true. There's no way Dave Ramsey and Susie Orman can't be wrong about this. They're not wrong. They've just failed to learn what so many other people have failed to learn. And that is the next step that we're going over. And then once you do it and you're like, holy crap, it works exactly how they show. And I kind of always giggle and laugh. And Stephen does. He's kind of smiling right now. You know, always giggling and laughing. We're like, uh, of course it works that way. Like, you know, we don't have 4,500 clients and add 300 to 500 a month because this doesn't work. I think you'd find an awful lot of Reddits out there saying, these guys, that Stephen and Chris on What the F and Wealth Webinar and that Andrew guy, they're all full of crap. Find it, please. It doesn't exist. Why would that not exist? Because what we're showing you actually fucking works, believe it or not. And so the people out there who are saying this doesn't work, uh, first of all, anyone we found doesn't know how it works. So what they're doing is, oh, it doesn't work. When you're presented with something and your brain's presented with something that you don't know and that's really totally new to you, what it tries to do is go from things I know in the past. Oh, I've got loans, but I got to pay them back. Oh, wait, I have a bank account, but it doesn't pay me anything. You're trying to you, you take all of this information and try to make a new memory out of it. A lot of people have a lot of trouble doing that, especially because this doesn't work <laughs> like anything else you've ever done. Mike's comment, the credit card companies must oh, yeah. hate you guys. I don't oh, know. We were like a badge of honor. Actually, no, that's our next t-shirt. Credit cards <laughs> hate us. <laughs> Like credit card busters. <laughs> Forget about the ghost busters, folks. Right. We're the credit card busters. I specifically want to answer this question. So it's, uh, Ricardo said, hey, Stephen, when you borrow from the whole life, is there a time limit to pay back their loan? Um, yes, you have to pass on some time. Um, so usually because it's taken out of the death benefits and advance out of it. I just wanted to answer that one. But graduate, graduate pass, pass on, pass on die. Yeah. <laughs> Someday we're all going to have to cross yeah. that, uh, that but gate. Banks have been making money and they make a hell of a lot of money and they do, they've been doing it for hundreds of years. They really know what they're doing. And so what we're doing is we're mimicking what the banks do. First of all, they, I mean, put money out, collect money, keep the money flowing. That's what we're, that's what we're trying to do. And that's what we're trying to show people. But any new concept is always going to take people a while to get it. Um, you know, how long is it before, between when you saw your first policy, when you saw this at first and when you got your first policy? So Dude, I, Brent made me watch a 90 minute video. This is going back I think 2014. He made me watch a 90 minute video. And that was the video that changed it all. I was a, a high level financial advisor back then. I was in the advisory world of 14 years. So I thought I knew everything like many advisors do, mm -hmm. you know, and when I saw this, I just didn't even believe it was true. So what I did is I, after watching the video, Brent actually agreed to do a phone call with it with me, which is why we require a 90 minute video. We require that anyone that wants to get on the phone with Steven, Joseph, Gabby, or anyone of our money mentors, they have to watch a 90 minute video. And the reason for that folks is that's what I had to do. And if I was a high level financial advisor and I knew all about this stuff, why would I have to watch a video just to come in and have somebody show me how to do this? Well, the same reason as you have to, is we got to learn from point A to point B, what this thing does, how it works, and why it will solve your problem. And if you don't, then we can't get on a call. If, so that's the most important reason why everybody has to watch a 90 minute call or a 90 minute video. And you can get that video, just go to chrisnoggle.com and it'll pop right up. It'll say 90 minute video. And you're like, I don't have 90 minutes. Great, watch the 10 part video series or we'll email it to you after this recording and you can watch it and then, and only then can you jump on a call with one of us and then we answer questions for you. We have a YouTube channel too, the, the Chris Noggle on YouTube. Take a look at it. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of videos on there because sometimes all you need is that one way to say it. Um, I had a programming professor of mine years ago said, you can paint the wall going up and down. You can paint it going back and forward. You can paint it in circles. You're still painting the wall. Sometimes that just one way you paint the wall and it looks better. You know? So it's a YouTube channel has a lot of stuff as well that you can take a look at it. Look at some of the case studies, look at the way that it's being used. You're finally going to get your aha moment. All of us did it. It took, it took a while to get it. I mean, I think even Brent took two years before he got his first policy because mm -hmm. it just took that bit of getting your head around it. Nope, not a scam. Yep. This does work the way you think it works. Uh, one, it's just going to be the information going to you in some way that just, that's the part that you needed to hear. And the, the how, about this, Chris, and, how about this? I spoke to my financial advisor and he told me to put it in mutual funds instead. Yeah, that's what I, <laughs> of 
course he did. Of course he did. Because you know what? When I was a financial advisor, that's exactly what I would have told you sure. to do, Francisco. I would have been like, ah, oh, that whole life. No, no, no. Let's put that money in a managed. That's why I don't call myself a financial advisor anymore because it's such go- oh. oh Yeah. I let all my licenses, my Series 7, 66, 663, and all those, I just let them all expire. Mm-hmm. And it was a great day. I'll never forget it. I retired from that sure. world, sold my practice in 18. It takes two, like for two years, you have the ability to hang your license with another broker. And on that day, it was a bittersweet. I'll never forget it was in October of 2020. I knew that was the moment where my Series 7 expired and I could never get it back unless I restudied and went through the Series 7 exam, which Stephen will tell you is the equivalence or any advisor, anyone that's taken it will tell you it's the equivalence of it's actually supposedly harder than the bar exam is a higher failure rate than the bar exam. Mm -hmm. It's it's a it's a bastard of a test and I'll never, ever have it again. Mm -hmm. But yeah, uh, Francisco, when I was an advisor, guess what I would have told you to do? Hey man, let's get some of those mutual funds. Mm-hmm. Yep. And let's buy some of that term. If you need some of that life insurance stuff, we'll sell you some term and invest that difference. Mm-hmm. Yep. I was on that program too. So, so from some of you watching this, you're probably like, Hey, this Jason example is great, but I don't have any debt. So I'm going to have Andrew queue up another map where we're going to start talking about some different things that aren't debt related that are, that are fun. And you just stop sharing for you. There we go. That are fun. But um, you know, it, it's funny let me just hit a few things here. I want you to all understand one thing, because this is something that comes up a lot. You probably ask yourself, and and I want Stephen to chime in here. If this is so good, if what you guys are talking about is so good, and all these people commenting on here, all whatever, 100 people that are commenting in a positive way, like if all these people say this is so good, why haven't I heard about this? Because in my ultimate wisdom, and all these people that I hang out with, and I'm in a pretty high net worth uh, you know, client or customer, friend basis or whatever you want to say, like someone would have known about this. Well, let me tell you why. Depending on your circle of friends, unless you're hanging out with multi multi millionaires or billionaires, chances are they probably have not heard about this. Mm. Why is it that for, you know, 14 years of an 18 or 16 year financial advisory career that I never heard about this? Stephen, did you ever hear about this when you work for Ameriprise? I never heard about this. And I've been in alternative assets for 10 years after Ameriprise. So no. I had a friend of mine who was in mortgages for probably about 20 years or so. And it was funny. He's a pretty high net worth individual, but his financial advisor told him, no, it's only for the really, really rich. Oh yeah. We hear that. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> but, but that person <laughs> at least has some level of knowledge of it. Oh no, that's only for the really wealthy. And the reason for that, why do people think this is only for the really wealthy or why haven't they heard about it? Well, primarily in those upper circles, it has been only for the really wealthy solely for one reason and one reason only the wealthy have teams of advisors that are paid on retainers, not commissions, Mm -hmm. that are paid to go out and find opportunities for these wealthy families. And we'll just talk about um, family-owned offices. They are paid to go out and find opportunities for these these families. Mm -hmm. So what they do is they go out and they find things like this. Well, if a wealthy family is looking for an opportunity or a better place to store their capital, where would they look? Or where would they have their team of advisors look? Well, guys, hey, if we really want to know where to put our money, why don't we just look at other wealthy families that have been doing this? All right, I don't know. Sure. Like, who are you thinking? Well, I don't know. Let's start with the Rothschilds. They're the wealthiest. What do they do with their money? Okay. And then let's let's move on from the Rothschilds to the next richest family, arguably the Rockefellers. What do they do with their money? Folks, you guys should read the books on the Rockefellers. Why is it that their money never left their family? Why is it that each generation, they got wealthier and wealthier? Folks, it's no secret. They controlled their money. They used exactly what I'm showing. No secret at all. And the death benefit, which we never talk about, just went to the trust to fund the next generation's premiums. Holy smokes, now you're starting to see it. And why is it that Walt Disney opened Walt Disney World using his whole life insurance policy? Because it's the only thing that didn't tank in the Great Depression. So that would be where the wealthy families would go. They'd be like, hey, guys, let's not reinvent the wheel here. Somebody's done this. Somebody's got a better place to put their money. Find it. Day later, they come back and be like, hey, man, we, we read some books on the Rockefellers. We found it. The secret of wealth. We found the best place to hold your money. Great, great. What is it? Whole life, man. It's a whole life policy. You got to be kidding me. Like, that's the best you could come up with? Yes, sir. That's where the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds put their money. You told us to go to the wealthiest families in history, find out what they do with money and how they use it. And that's what they did. Sir, it is not a normal whole life. It is so different than anything I've ever seen and so specialized that I, that I don't even know how to design this. We're going to have to find somebody that knows how to build one of these. Okay, so you're telling me we're going to put our money, our, our hundreds of millions of dollars into a whole life? No, sir. You're going to put it into a specially designed and engineered whole life that we got to find some bastard to create. Okay, 
And what's that going to do? Sir, it's going to pay you uninterrupted compound interest. You know all those banking and those oil things that you do? Well, what we're going to do is we're just going to change where your money goes first. Then we're going to take that money out. We're going to go invest in oil. We're not going to stop earning interest on all of the money. So wait a second. You're, you're telling me we're going to put our money in a specially designed whole life. And then we're going to take our money out right away. And we're going to go invest in the things that I really like, those oil investments that we're doing. Yes, sir. And you're never going to stop earning interest and dividends on that money. That's what the wealthy families did that we researched. All right, sir, carry on. Sorry, that was a bit of a joke, but you get the point. Like the wealthy have had access to this because they have teams that have gone and done the research that you haven't. Second reason why you haven't heard about this, your advisor, your trusted family advisor, your Chris Nago from back in the day, your Stephen Nagy from that back in the day that wears a suit every day, that drives the BMW or maybe the Mercedes or vice versa. You know, the, they, they have all the fanciest things, the pocket ties, the Rolex watch, the front. They show up and they're like, all right, so what are we doing today? Well, we're looking for a place to store our capital. Great. And then what does that advisor do? And no disrespect to any advisors, but typically they're thinking, all right, well, we got this and we got this, we got this, all the things they've been taught. And which one are they going to point to? Well, let's do this one, the IUL. Well, why are we going to do an IUL? I just watched a video that they talked about whole life. Well, the IUL is way better. Why is it better? Well, what you're not going to hear is that the IUL pays a much better commission. Okay, so and put it into perspective, an IUL, and maybe not all, but let me just, the ones that we've seen, which is lots of them, if somebody puts $10,000 into an IUL, the commission is going to be between $9,000 and $12,000. That's a good day in the advisors. That's a great day. Stephen, would you be okay with that? Cool. 10 grand premium goes in, you get paid nine, I'd be okay. But then you go I'm and you, you design mm -hmm. one of these whole lives with mass mutual. And then all of a sudden you put 10 grand in and you get your commission statement and you're kind of looking at it like, I don't have a piece of paper, but you look at it and you're like, oh, this can't be right. You call mass mutual, hey, mass mutual, uh, that commission you just paid me on that ten thousand dollar premium, that that there's something wrong. You got the decimal. You're place missing the a zero place. there, maybe That's even right. two. <laughs> it's not wrong. Well, why is it so low? Because I could have sold an IUL and made nine thousand. You just paid me three hundred eighty-seven dollars. Like, what happened? And the insurance company says, "Well, sir, you designed the policy so that your client gets all the money early on. So you took a, a reduction in your commission." Oh, well, I'm not doing that anymore. Because if you try this with regular whole life insurance policy, I, I, don't, I don't mean to, to, to be an ass yeah. or whatever, but that's what it is. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Chris, I'm getting a lot of comments coming in. People that don't have debt, they're saying they have HELOC money, they have other money. I have a couple of case studies. Can we talk a little bit maybe about once we're beyond the debt aspect, Hold what this can really do? All okay, right, so Andrew, show them, show them the good shit, man. Show them, show, pull out the big dog. Yeah, exactly. We're done with the debt. We're done with the debt. Before, debt. before, before we get there, one, one technical question. Sure. They were talking about how loan interest is charged up front in some cases. What do they mean by that? Can you just explain? So that there are a couple quick? of companies that we do have where, yes, the loan interest is paid all up front. Remember, it's simple interest and it's going to be charged anyway. What will happen is if you pay off the loan a little bit early, so let's say after six months versus a year, they'll, re they'll debit you that interest back again. So it sounds really odd what it is. It actually works. It ends up working out in your favor. Um, I, there's one company that we use that does that. And the way that they, they process the interest, it's hard to get into without going into like another hour explanation. Can, exactly I just give it, can I just give it a shot? You do. Super. I don't mean to cut you off, but I know you like getting into detail. They, they just <laughs> try not to. Really quick. Not to. <laughs> Why is the interest charge all up front? Well, they take, it's really simple. They take the $10,000 loan that you just took out. They multiply that times the loan interest rate, which before 7702 is 5%. It's 500 bucks. Yep. You guys can see it on the camera. That's, that's the amount that you owe. Yep. And, and the insurance company is just assuming you're not going to pay the loan back. So that's the amount for the year. But let's just say you pay it off halfway through the year. Now what they're going to do is they're going to credit you back for half of a year of interest, which works out in your favor. Yep. So that's it. It's, it's one of those things, yeah. It's, and to be honest, whenever I hear questions about, oh, how much interest am I paying on the loan? What people are forgetting is how much interest they're, what they're earning on the money that they're doing as well, which is more than the, the interest rate on the loan anyway. Right, which is this next part. Exactly. So, so we already taught you how to, how to take, uh, we showed you Jason paying off, you know, a bunch of credit cards, a bunch of super high level or high interest stuff. So here we go. Um, let's take a peek at uh, how to use this. Uh oh, via, uh -oh. Uh -oh. my fault. Wrong button. Dude. Sorry, your man. Try. It's your turn now, right? I know. We're just hitting all the wrong buttons here. Got it. Let's make sure that get There you go. All righty. So let's, uh, let's take a look at something here. Let me share my screen. So now that you've paid off all your debt, what the hell do I do with this policy? There's a whole bunch of things. Remember your- And G, real it? fast. 
while you guys are messing with that camera, Gene just popped up and said, um, everyone, I'm a member of the private money club. I use my policies to get 10 to 12% on private loans through the private money club. It works. I have 10 loans out right now. Just try and be in first lien position, which we can talk more about. So Gene's talking about if you're at the position where you're going to move money, which Andrew's getting ready to show you, but you don't have any idea about private money lending or what we're about to talk about, don't worry. We put together the private money club for you. So if, if we're talking about things right now in this next part that is new to you or you don't completely understand, it's fine. We're going to, we're going to cover all that too. Just want to preface that real fast. So let me just let me just show this to you really fast. Um, so once you've paid off your debt, now that you don't have, and I'll go into a couple of examples of how people use this. When I'm coming up with these examples, I want to have people who are various different levels. So um, you know, we're, we'll show policies from ten thousand to a million. It doesn't matter. Um, I just want to get the concept of what I'm showing first, and I'll show a few different examples about how to use this. So um, real estate. We all know that real estate is one of the best ways to, it's the best place to make money. It's a tangible asset behind it. It's, you know, it, it, every single wealthy person, doesn't matter what sort of political spectrum you're on, where, where you're at in life, all of them have real estate. That's, this is the best way to create wealth. So what would happen is if I have no debt at all, I, I've already paid off all my high level credit cards because that's the first thing we want to. We want that really toxic debt done first. What happens when I'm done with all of it? Okay, cool. I'm going to go into private lending. I'm going to become the bank and other people are going to be my customers. I like the sound of that. Yeah, absolutely. So what I'm going to do is the money multiplier policy that we have, okay? Um, it's a money multiplier policy that we have. Uh, yeah, that's not working. Right. All right, that's not working. Um, so the money You're multiplier the policy, guy, I don't know what's going on with it today. It's just weird. So I take money from my money multiplier policy, loan rate, eh, let's say four to 5%. Everyone's going to be a little bit different. Okay, so I take an a loan into a segregated bank account. Only reason we have the segregated bank account is just to kind of you know, just as a, a, a holding place. I want to see everything that's coming in and out of this policy. So that's the segregated bank account. So I take a loan at four to five percent into the segregated bank account, and I loan that out on a loan note at twelve percent. Okay, cool. I kind of like this. So let's say let's use five percent for my loan uh, from the policy. So right now I'm making what 7% <laughs> spread right off the top, okay? Make the monthly loan payments back into the segregated bank account and at least pay off your interest on these loans every single year. So quick detail here that I'd like to get into. You never have to pay back these loans. You never have to make that pay back these loans. However, uh, we always, always recommend that you do. And the reason we always recommend that you do um, is there's, you, you um, you will end up still paying some interest on the loans and they, this stays out there. Yeah, always pay back the interest. Um, so I pay back the interest every year, back into my money multiplier policy. Next year, I take out a loan at four or 5%. I do the same thing over and over again. So I'm making a spread of 7% on that money. I'm also earning interest and dividends on the entire amount itself too, both. So I've made money twice and it, best way to make the bank and i don't have to deal with termites tenants or toilets right yeah i mean this is one way to do it i'll give you an, a different example while andrew's trying to figure out why his mouse no longer <laughs> works <laughs> annoying i hate computers i truly do yeah, I um wrong, just recently we bought a new copy machine here at the company so i just got the bill literally i think it's seventy eight hundred dollars for the copy machine we used to lease the copy machine for like 170 some dollars a month and in doing that, what now this is exactly where I'm going right here. Actually, I didn't know you had this up. So just show that one. This, this is it written out right there. Uh, just move We're this out of the way. Fancy stuff. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I, I have money in my policies. Yeah. So I've got the invoice, which is over here. Okay. I've got the invoice. Forget about this stuff, but I've got an invoice for 7,800 bucks. Mm -hmm. I take the loan from my policy for 7,800, super small amount. And if I didn't have 7,800, I could call somebody like Drew, or I could call somebody like Gene and I could say, Hey, listen, can you lend me money uh, at a rate of 6%? And they probably would, but I, I had the money. So what I do is I actually loan the money to my company. Yeah. I take the loan from the policy and then I structure a promissory note. I don't care if it's handwritten, you know, I, Chris Noggle, O, or Lent, um, money school, $7,865 at 6% interest, sign, date, you know, and, and that. But my promissory note's typed out, and it is 6%. It's so what I charge. Works out to be, I think, if I just did it to $228 or whatever it is, it's okay. I think it's, we'll just call it $220 a month. So instead of paying their, the, somebody else's leasing company 179 
what I'm doing is paying myself back $220 a month. But I lent the money to my company to do that. So my company, when it pays for that copy machine, just like it did when it leased, it still gets the tax write off because it's a loan that the company owns. It just pays me interest only. So that company, my company is going to pay me that payment every single month, which represents 6% of the $7,800, whatever that works out to be. And then, I don't know, three years, five years, when we're done with this copy machine, ready to upgrade the other, I've pretty much repaid my banking policy, all of the money for that copy machine, all of it. It's just all repaid. And then I just go and I sell the copy machine. Doesn't even matter what I get for the copy machine. Too many people are like, oh, I got to get X amount to cover the, the lease, you know, that I have on this and the buyout. They got you. When, when you lease, they got you by the you-know-whats because they're in control. When I'm my bank and I lend to my company to buy a copy machine or whatever the hell else I want to buy, I'm in full control. So when I sell the copy machine, that's, that's gravy on the top. Money school keeps that money and whatever. We'll buy more of these fancy lights that take the shadows off of us. <laughs> but you get the point. Like, this is just another way. All of you that don't have that, you probably have companies. Do you have companies? And if you have companies, does your company ever need money? Do you ever borrow money from the bank? And I mean the traditional bank for your company to finance equipment, marketing, anything. You probably do. That's a good Go idea. I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a small business. I own my own business. There's times when it could take 60 to 90 days for a client to pay me. You know, some of my clients do take a long time to pay. Get a loan out of my policy. Don't have to use a line of credit. I use a loan. And that way then I keep the money with myself. The money's going back into my segregated bank account, my bank. And I don't have to go paying for a line of credit. I, you know, I'd rather pay myself the money than somebody else, right? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, and that's kind of what this flow chart says. But go one step further. Let's say I didn't buy a copy machine because the copy machine started stopped with my company, right? It was just this first part you're looking at. But let's just say then I lent the money to my company for at 6%. And then I'm just going to pick on Drew again. Drew comes to me and says, Chris, I'm buying this double and I need a hundred grand. So what if I lent my company money at 6%, I gave it a hundred grand for my policy. And then I lend that money to Drew from my company at 12%. Drew, you're paying pretty good these days, man. Thanks. <laughs> so he pays me 12%. Then those monthly interest checks from Drew's loan come back into my company, but my company gets to then benefit and get some, you know, tax advantages because inside of a company you have more things you can write off than you can personally and then my company then just pays me back half or six percent of the 12 and that money goes back into my policy see i'm making money personally because the loan started in my bank i never stopped earning interest on that money and then that money went out there and worked at a rate of 12 percent of which i get six back so i make money my company makes money and my company gets a tax write-off for half of the interest that it that it earned from Drew's loan. But the funny part is, is I own the company and I own the policy. So how many times did I just make money there? Let's count. One. one. So one for the 6%. So no, I made one here. They okay. See the spread. See my mouse. Oh, sorry. So I made one on the spread. So it's between the six and the four, the six. Let's, we're going to no, say no, no. five. No, 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 yeah. no, no. The spread. My policy, oh, yeah. and we'll use 6%, which is what my policy pays. And I use a cash value line of credit, oh, yeah, but we'll okay. just round up to four. So what's six minus four, folks? It's two, right? So I made two. money once on the spread. Then where else did I make money? Made money on the yeah. one up between there and there. Then I lent the right. money to my company at 6%. So I made money a second twice, time. Twice. Yep. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I took from here into my company and I loaned it out at 12. I've made money three times. Three times. So in the policy because there's a difference between the amount that I take out, the loan percentage rate, we're gonna say 5% and the 6% you earn, so there's one. There's two from the loan note between your segregated account and your company when you loan it, and then one more when you loan it out to other people. And some people that are watching this, their heads, their heads spinning, they're like, oh, I, I don't follow that. Good. Yeah. What, we're talking to you about the mapping team. The mapping team yeah. will, will put all this in paper. They will do all this for you. They will show you how many ways you're going to make money. They will help you structure all this, except for we don't do legal. We don't do accounting or tax advice. And we need you to tell us what you want to do. You can come to us like Drew and say, hey, guys, I got this dumb whole life you told me to set up. And I want, I want my money to work for me. So what do you suggest? And we say, go to Private Money Club. And, and Drew goes to Private Money Club reluctantly. And he's like, oh, they're just trying to capitalize on me and charge me again. And he finds right off the bat a loan that he can make to a deal with Chris Root. And he lends it out to Chris Rude, and he's like, oh, man, that works. And he comes back, and he says to the mapping team, hey, guys, I got this deal. 
It says this loan thing. I mean, can you guys show me what this whole thing looks like? And the mapping team, boom, 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 maps it out, gives you the cash flow. Here you go, Drew. And Drew's like, damn, man, that was pretty good. I can see two years into the future of how much money I made. And it's like when you first learned how to ride a bike, you didn't just hop on the bike and start going. And well, I hope you didn't, because you probably have some wounds from that. Um, you know, you had training Kevin, wheels on it. Kevin's right? head spin. <laughs> yeah. it, it's it's yeah. not, it's just complicated because we're going fast and because Andrew's using different numbers than me and head spinning. But again, don't don't get hung up in the numbers because all of you are trying to be like, wait, it was, it was split, blah, blah, blah. forget it. And Concept. You're head spinning because you don't, you're not used to thinking like this. You're not used to thinking about how many times I can make money on my money. You know, as I as I look at all of this, and as I kind of go through it, and you know, help Chris to kind of show people how this works, I've learned that the rich don't make money once; they they make money multiple times over and over again. Banks make multi, multi, money multiple times over and over again, but that is not something that you're taught to do. You're taught, let me put this into a savings account, let me put this into uh, mutual funds, let me just let it sit there for a while, kind of make my point zero 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 one percent that my bank's paying me right now. Um, and let it go. So that's why your head is spinning so much. This is really different than what you're used to. And not only that, folks, this one that we just did where, we, you know, with my example of me buying a copy machine and then the example of me lending the money to my company, then lending the money out again through Private Money Club, that's an advanced technique. But again, with today's training, we didn't just want to show you paying off decks. I know a couple of people were commenting, oh, I got that, but now my head's spinning on that last one. We're, we're just trying to make sure that no matter what stage you're at, whether you're at this early stage, if you got to take back the money you're giving away to everybody else. You got to pay your debts off. We do that. Or maybe you're at the stage where I'm thinking about buying a car or paying off my car loan with this. Great. We've got that. Or maybe you're at the advanced stage where like, I've already done that. I've done that. I've done, give me the good stuff, guys. I want the complicated shit. Well, that's what we just did. Do we have one more map we can quickly show? So um, as far as the, let me just take a look and see what we got. So, so I just wanted to actually go through really, really quickly because you'll see this, you'll see this flow that we use regularly, I got it back up here too. Um, this is something that I came up with when I first started working um, and I wanted to show people how to do it. This is the flow, kind of into a segregated bank account from a loan note out again, you're making money a couple of times. So it's, we're just using an iteration of this. This is the basic, the basic concept that we're trying to show. Money comes out of your policy, money goes back into your bank or goes out, put your little green men to work, Monthly loan come, payments come back, you pay off your interest every year. So we're just kind of going in through different iterations of it. Let me see what else I can find here. Um, I was gonna use Devin because he just he's got a, a much bigger policy. Yeah, does anyone on here like yeah, you don't need to comment, but I'm sure some people on here are like, is there anyone that does this with big, big numbers? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, okay, go ahead. No, no, yeah, no, yeah, kind of different subject, but I was just gonna say I have a uh, a good little layout of using a refi on some rental properties, taking that money and then and then kind of using it to grow more money. So tapping into equity. I don't know if we want to draw that out on the board or something, but that's from one of our current clients I spoke to earlier. He was just asking if we could whiteboard it either now or during asking anything later. Sure. You want me to just jump on the board real quick? And I think it'd be great because does anybody on here have rental properties? And then we'll get to questions, yeah. folks. I see the questions coming in. So we will answer your questions. We'll leave a few minutes at the end because this won't take Chris, long. Chris is happy he gets to use the whiteboard. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, Stephen, um, what, what kind of an example are we doing here? Okay. So these are five. So, so they're thinking about they have five rental properties and they're considering doing a cash out refi right now. Okay. okay. Do you know I'll what explain. they're going to use the money for, though? When it goes in the policy, I got to know where's the destination. What are we putting in the GPS? It's going to all be private lending. Okay, so I'm just asking because I'm going to switch what we're doing. All right, so diagrams, private money, private lending. Uh, what are you? Private lending. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I can change the numbers. So Stephen, you just give me the numbers. All right. So lay it on me. So where's wh where's their money going now, and what's it coming from? So just kind of lay the whole thing out, and I'll draw it for everybody. Well, yeah. So right now, there's they don't have access to the money because it's all within the homes. It's equity within the homes. So what the plan is is to do a cash out refi, and we get this question a lot. You know, should we do a cash out refi because of the cost involved and things like that? So I think this is a good example. So they have five homes doing a cash out refi. They're going to get access to 175 thousand cash, or so they're going to get 175. Okay. And that's not money from their income. That's just money that's sitting lazy in the rafters of their rental homes, right? Yes, correct, yeah. correct. So right. the cash flow is going to remain the same, things like that. So there's going to be total closing cost of fifteen thousand to fifteen. Okay. Want to do it a color that was easier to write? All right. So we got one seventy five minus fifteen for the closing. Their cost. current rate is three point seven five. The new rate will be four. 
Okay, four percent. So plus quarter. Point. Oh, I'm going to put this up here. So this is the interest rate on the refinance. On the refi for the five house is correct. Okay, and then the plan would be to take that money and lend it out. We can maybe cycle through the policy first, but just for simplicity, lend it out at let's say twelve percent deals. Okay, got that. Okay. All right, so we're going to dump in the net here. So, so here's where the question really comes. To do the cash out refi, they're not saving on interest long term, right? So that's kind of a wash, let's say. So they're paying fifteen thousand through fifteen in closing costs. So they're basically losing that twelve percent the first year. If we look at it that way, because if they take that one seventy five, one out ten percent, they're barely making anything, right? A little bit of a spread, let's say. First year, right? First year, but then every year after that, that'd be pure profit, essentially, right? Yeah. So basically, if they didn't use the policy and they just took the refi, took the money and lent it out, their first year, they're that's a wash because it took them fifteen thousand to refi. But if they change where the money goes first, that you know that refi, technically the policy would pay for that over time. Or they could, you know, so it just gives them the ability to recapture the money that the refi costs. I, I never thought about that. Okay. Right. So, so just real fast, so looking at two different ways then. So doing this strategy without putting it in the policy first, you're going to make a straight, let's say, 12% return on that 175 for the next 10 years, right? Yeah. Now, what I'd like to see, I don't know if we have a 175 policy or something similar, but if we were to put that in the policy first, pull it out, do the same lending over 10 years, what the total overall wealth looks like. Because remember, he has the income coming in from the 5 We talk a lot about multiple streams of income, right? Creating additional income streams. And that's the whole point of this is to create an additional income stream. So right now they already have the rental income coming in by tapping that equity. Now they're taking that equity and creating an, another private lending income stream. And if we take that money and first run it through the policy, now we've created created a third bucket that's growing uninterrupted compounding for the rest of their life, right? So I just want people to see like, all we're doing is creating extra income streams by using what we already have. In this case, we're taking income from rental properties, we're creating income from private lending, and we're creating wealth growth within the policy. So we're adding two extra income streams by doing nothing different, essentially. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you got, you're making three money, three places, the rental on, or the rental on that is one. The access to the loan through the refi gives them the ability to lend that money out at 12%. We're going to do it through the policy so that now they're earning interest plus dividends uninterrupted here. So now we're making money a second time or a third in this. And then also then they get to make the money on the loan at 12%, which is probably most of the loans I do are all first secured, meaning the real estate provides the security. And then, then the most important thing for them is a lot of people go back to the old way of thinking. How many times do we have to kind of just beat that into people's heads not to go back to the old way of thinking? They want to take this 12% interest and just put it in somebody else's bank because that, that's what they've been trained to do for me, 44 years, however old all of you are. You've been trained to just take that 12% interest you made and put it in someone else's bank. Stop. Take that money and put that money back in your bank. Why would you, after all this, why would you then take money, your money made for you and put it in someone else's bank? Put it back in your bank. The problem you're going to have if you start doing this, if this client keeps doing this, we're not going to be able to get all this money back into the policy. We're going to have to start a second policy, a third policy, a fourth policy to hold that much capital. Because listen, folks, here's the thing that I wasn't going to get into today. But when you learn this and you start applying this, your money will continually be working for you all the time. When your money works for you, it creates offspring. Okay, Your money working for you always creates offspring. The offspring is right here, 12% interest. That 12% interest cannot all go back into the policy because of IRS rules. Don't get hung up on that. But the reason I have nine of these policies on my life alone, three on my wife, two on my mom, one on my daughter. The reason I have nine on me is not because I want to brag that I have nine. I don't want nine. I want one. But you can't ever have one. 91% of all 4,500 of our clients, Sandra, correct me if it's 90 or 91, start their second banking policy before year two. It's because... We want to move more of our money through this banking system because we learn how it works. To do that, you can't do it with just one policy. All of you, when you begin your journey on this, you'll never just have one policy. You'll start with one and you'll max that one out. And then after that, you'll be like, damn, I got too much money in somebody else's bank. My rule, $10,000. My wife knows it and hates it, but she knows it. She's always like, honey, how come we don't ever have any money in the bank? And I'm like, here's your sign. Watch the video again, honey. How many times you got to see the video? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We keep it in our bank, but I don't see that. 
She says, I don't see that. I said, yeah, because you don't log in. I didn't give you the passwords to log into my bank accounts or my policy accounts. So she's always only looking at bank accounts at someone else's banks of $10,000 or less. It doesn't make her feel super secure. But then I tell her, honey, listen, our money's out there working. Like we get this check and this check and this check and this one and this one and this one and this one and this one. Oh my God, we make that much. And the only thing she ever says to me is, shit, how much we're gonna have to pay taxes or how much we're gonna have to pay in taxes. I'm like, honey, it's gonna be bad. It's And that's it. All right. Texas Was that good enough, policy. Steve? Steven? Yeah, absolutely. He said, is this why big banks insure important employees? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's funny you should mention that. Yeah. One last thing, and we're going to get to questions, folks. So who is the number one purchaser of these stupid whole life policies that we just showed you? Can anyone tell me who the number one purchaser of these are? It's right. It's from Boley. <laughs> banks. Why do banks put their money here? Do I have to answer that? I think we just explained. But a bank is an entity. A bank can't just buy a life insurance policy. They got to have a body to insure. Just like I insure my body, I insure Larissa, I insure my daughter Vivi. Like those are the bodies that we insure. Banks need bodies. So how many of you have walked into a bank recently? Say I. Okay. Okay. So you got your dumb dumb sucker. You got your coffee. Yep. I. All right. When you walked in there, just be hundred percent honest. Did you see somebody with a tag that said vice president? I just want to know, did you see someone in that bank when you walked in without really looking for it that was a vice president? Ethan said, yep. He was mopping the floor, I think. I think he was the- Mopping the floor. Maybe the guy was putting the water in the, the Keurig, yeah. right? VP of coffee making. VP of janitorial services. VP of janitorial. VP of lending. VP of lending number two. VP of lending number three. You get the point? Yeah, there we go. <laughs> They're all vice presidents, except for the teller. Tellers like low person on the totem pole, but they very quickly get, they have moved up. How many of you have gone to the bank and seen the same teller for longer than six months? Mm -hmm. Nope. That's just where they start. Then all of a sudden they have this sit down with their manager. So Julie, you're doing a great job of being a teller. You're doing a wonderful job of getting more people to put money in our stupid products with high commission. So we have already upped your allowance for dumb, dumb suckers. But now what we're going to do is we're going to give you a promotion. We are going to make you the vice president of stocking dumb, dumb suckers. And we're gonna give you a raise. But not only that, we are going to give you a fully paid up life insurance policy. That's right. Because of your hard work, you're going to get a $50,000 whole life, or you're gonna get a $50,000 death benefit that no matter how long you live, that money's gonna be paid out to your spouse. What do you think of that? And if you stay at this bank long enough, we'll up it to 100. And then not only that, if you stay with us for 20 more years, just 20 more years, by then, you'll only be 68 years old. By 68, what we will give you is a deferred compensation, meaning what we're going to do is we're going to pay you an income from that 68th year till you're dead. And that's going to be called a deferred compensation plan. So what do you think? You want to be a, a vice president? Of course, yes. Sign me up. And then that bank does one thing. That, that paperwork's done. They get that badge. That bank goes out and buys a stupid whole life insurance policy on that brand new vice president. And how much do you think the death benefit on that whole life policy is? Anyone think it's 50 or hundred grand that they promised that employee for their, their paid up? Nope. Probably a million, 2 million, maybe 3 million, depending on salary. They're going to max it out. And they're going to put the most amount of money they can into that stupid whole life. And then all they're going to do is as that money goes in and whose money's going in there, I just want to be clear that everyone understands whose money's going into that whole life. Your money, Andrew's money, Stephen's money, my money, ten, up to 10000 anyway, is going into that policy. They're going to use our money to fund those premiums. And then what's going to happen is they're going to use that money. Yeah, they're going to invest it. They're going to use it to pay health benefits. They're going to use it to do all the things that they need to do because they understand un uninterrupted compound interest. Then someday, that vice president, the day they retire, they go off and they go on vacation and they realize the purpose of life was not to just do nothing and they die at 70 years old. And then a death benefit is paid to their family for 50 or $100,000. Their family thanks the bank. Oh my God, I'm so glad, mm -hmm. you know, she put in all those years in that bank because without that, we wouldn't have had any life insurance, but we got paid this $100,000 death benefit. How much money do you think the bank just got in a death benefit? The difference, mm -hmm. one, two, three million dollars. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> those mothers. <laughs> no, don't be upset at the banks. Don't be upset at the banks. They just know something you don't know, but now you know it.
with news, with new information, there's two ways you can do it. You can be upset with it and say, "Oh my, God, this is terrible," or you learn what they do. <laughs> yeah, you just admit, you know, all we ever do, do folks, it. is teach. <laughs> like nothing simple about, or nothing complicated about what yeah. Stephen, myself, and Andrew do here every single day. We just do what the the wealthy do. We just mimic it, and we just do what the banks do, and we just mimic it. There's nothing hard about this. We didn't we didn't come up with this stuff. I just decided that I, I was pretty good at teaching at a fifth grade level. Yeah. All right, uh, let's hit some questions, Stephen. I know Drew's no longer here, so we can hit his later, but what do we got? Using this example, what do you think of this plan? Borrow 50K from family, dump 44K and pay first 6K of premium, open an LLC, take CVLOC from all, and then loan my company the money at 6% and loan it privately at 12%, then take tax breaks with my LLC. I could offer the family member 5% simple interest a year, much better than sitting in a bank account at zero. Yeah, I've been talking with yeah. Sean on, on Instagram but in emails. I just couldn't keep up with them because I was traveling. Stephen, you probably should get a call set up with Sean. But um, all of that sounds really, really good. Yeah. Um, and you actually, Sean, it's funny because you actually listened. The initial time Sean was telling me kind of what his plan was. And then I kind of did a quick email, probably terrible typos in it because I was driving, just telling him you're missing one step. And Sean added that one step in there, which is taking the money and then moving the money a second time and making the money work for it. And I got a client, we're going to be doing a really cool case study, Sean and everybody else watching, where we're going to show a client that just went into force and she wants to pay off her, her, her truck loan. She's got a truck and she pays like $800 a month for this truck. I guess that's just the going rate for a pickup truck these days, but $800 a month. And she said, well, what if I put the money in the policy and I take the money right back out and I, I pay the truck off and then I pay my policy back 800. I said, yeah, that would be great. And then I asked her, I said, what's your interest rate on your truck? And she said, zero. I said, hold on. Now, although that would work, let's go one step further. I've got a Chris Rude deal coming and she's part of Private Money Club. So I said, why don't we do this? Why don't we take the money out of the policy and why don't we lend it? And it's 12%. And then we'll take the interest that you make on the loan and then we'll pay the truck payment. And I'm going to do an entire case study of showing how that's going to work using her policy. And and it's going to pay the truck off using money that's working for her a second time. So we're going to do that. And it's nicer when somebody else pays your bill, right? <laughs> Which is basically what we're doing. We're taking the money. Yep. Somebody else is paying the bills. All right. Perfect. Well, we got another one, Steve? Uh, let's see. I really got my whole life issued, but I haven't heard anything from a mapping team member. I under the impression they would reach out. Yeah, they should already, Garland, if so, not. Yeah, yeah. Garland, your yeah, policy should. was issued. Are you sure you didn't miss the email? It's in an email. They don't just call you. They, they email you saying, welcome to the family. It's time to set up your, actually. Yeah, what no, they yeah, it's, it's, so it says, welcome to the family. It tells you who your mapping person is. There's a questionnaire you have to fill out and then you could schedule a call with them. What I would do is double check your spam because um, spam field, we, they send so much um, email or there's so much email sent from that email address that you can get, they can get caught in spam. So double check with that, uh, double check your spam first, but yep, there's a questionnaire you fill out, they get a notification saying, hey, you're, we're ready to, to do it, so. Yeah, Garland, I just sent you yeah. Hannah's email too. Shoot her an email just saying you haven't heard from the mapping team. I guarantee you it went to spam because it's an yeah. automated email that goes out to you to set that call up. So yeah. just, just email her and she'll send it to you again. Yep. Uh, so two more real fast. Um, can this policy allow me to get rid of my policies through people like State Farm for life and disability? And I had that Kevin, earlier. Yeah, Kevin, we get this a lot. And here's the first thing I will tell you. And, and, and this is something I'm very passionate about. And it goes against some things that you might think we would do. So if that policy that you have is a whole life, I don't care what company it's with. I don't care if it's a really, really crappy design and not working well. If it's over five it really doesn't matter how old it is. I probably would never put my signature on a replacement of any whole life out there. Even if it's designed wrong, you know, well, my grandma bought this one for me and it's super small. It's $135 a year. Can I just move this into one of those fancy ones you guys do? No, keep that, mm -hmm. keep the policy you have because that policy, although not designed the way we do, although not performing the way we do, that policy will still be a great asset for you. I have old whole lives. That, I, that are nowhere near close to. I have two whole lives with New York Life when I work there. They're just standard off the shelf whole lives, but they're old. They've been maturing. Although they're not great, they're still good and I lend from them. So I would never put my signature and I can't speak for everybody, but I would never replace a whole life. Now, if you come to us with an IUL or a UL or a VUL, definitely chances are we're going to look at replacement if you're not deep into the surrender period. See, IULs lock you up. If you got an IUL or you buy one, you're stuck. 
because mm -hmm. they're going to slap a big old surrender fee, which means no matter what you do, you can't take that money out for a long period of time without losing a significant amount. Yeah. And even so, we have specially engineered whole life policies that are meant to give you a cash value at the beginning. Standard whole life policies will also give you a cash value, which is not anywhere near as close. So like a $10,000 a year policy, if one here it takes the third year and you get $1,000 back. <laughs> They're just not anywhere near as efficient for this. Yeah. And Sandra is asking, how do I become a member of the Private Money Club? It's easy. You go to privatemoneyclub.com. And I just sent that to her, privatemoneyclub.com. And you just sign up. And you can do the free. Right now, we're in beta 2.0. We just we are literally today inking the final contracts with the, the DevOps company that's going to develop out the, the final version of Private Money Club. It's about a $300,000 investment. And uh, we're going to be basically doing that entire development. So right now, you can get into it for free and kind of look at it and check it out. You cannot lend and you cannot borrow for free. It's $997 a year to be a member of Private Money Club and actually lend. But you can go in and check it out. Kind of, you know, what do they call that? Uh, no, no, what is it? Oh, Window shopping. Buy. You can do a bunch of window shopping, but you, you can't actually go in and buy. So I so. hope you guys enjoyed that episode. We're putting up tons of them, but I think if you like this one, you'll probably like that video as well. Click that alert button, actually smash that alert button, and you'll be notified every time we put a new video. So we'll see you on the next episode.